from John chapter 17, verses 24 to 26. We've come to the end of the Lord's high priestly prayer, and this is like every other chapter of Scripture that I finish preaching, and that is that as soon as I'm done, I am quite dissatisfied. I'm ready to go back to the beginning and start over and take a a second run at it because we learn and we see so much more as we work through these passages. And I hope that's been uh, the case for you. This is uh, an especially sacred scripture. I don't know if it's appropriate for us to even think that way, but, but it's as though when we step into John 17, we're moving from the holy place into the most holy place. Because here we are hearing the intra-Trinitarian dialogue. We are hearing the incarnate Son addressing the eternal Father. We are glimpsing things behind the veil that are so often mentioned or briefly explained in other parts of Scripture. But here we see the reality as we eavesdrop upon this conversation. We've spent eight lessons, I think, if my calculations are correct, to to work through this chapter, and yet that is barely a Sunday school survey. I noted that uh, the Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones preached 48 sermons on this chapter and made an entire book out of it. And if you think that is impressive, in the 17th century, the Puritan Anthony Burgess preached 145 expository sermons just on John 17. So I have a long way to go in learning how to expound Scripture. Before we read God's Word, let's bow together. Our God, we are gripped by our inadequacy as we open your word, and thus we should always feel. We should tremble with joy every time we take up the Bible each day to read your word to us. And yet, Lord, you know that we most often do not. We take for granted what a special sacred privilege it is to hear you speak in Scripture. And yet we do not do so today. Oh Lord, we have come to a passage that is so far above us and beyond our reach that we can only tremble and beg your help and pray, Lord, that you would teach us, that you would stretch our minds and open our hearts and bless us that we might see more of your glory even though we are hidden in the rock that is Christ. We pray, God, that you would bless and guide us in our thoughts and minds as we study your word this day and that you would help us and strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear now God's Word, John chapter 17, as our Lord Jesus speaks, beginning in verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Thus far the reading of God's word, may he add his blessing to it. I want to return to verse 24 this morning where we spent all of our time last week and and pick up the, the latter part of this verse as we look at the remainder of the chapter. Jesus is here speaking about the divine name that He has proclaimed and and consequently by means of that proclamation, the divine love that has come to dwell in His disciples. And as we dip back into this chapter for the last time, at least in this series, I want you to notice that what Jesus says in verse 24 is the last expression of desire in this prayer. Uh, Commentators uh, uh, perhaps are disagreed about whether it constitutes an actual petition. Verse 24, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Is Jesus asking the Father to do that? We might infer that. Or is he simply expressing, this is my heart. As the Redeemer, as the Savior of sinners, as the mediator of God's elect, I want to bring them to be with me where I am. And the remainder of the prayer is simply an affirmation that the work that the Son was given has been accomplished. That the blessings which we know and enjoy, we have by means of that work which has proven efficacious in our lives. I want to look at this, these a couple of verses, two and a half verses under four main headings. First of all, notice at the end of verse 24 that the Father loved Christ before the foundation of the world. 
We might have expected Jesus at this point to say, Father, you loved them, those that you've given to be with me. You, you loved them before the foundation of the world. And of course, the Bible does say that elsewhere. But that's not the conversation here. Here the conversation is about the, the Son's relationship by means of the covenant of redemption to the Father. And He says, Father, You loved Me before the foundation of the world. And it is because of the love that the Father has set upon the Son that we now enjoy that same love in ourselves. There are weighty theological issues to wrestle with in this part of the passage it's not that these matters are hard to understand per se, and it's certainly not that the text is unclear. It's plain in the statements that it makes. But these are ideas that oftentimes believers never grapple with. It never appears on their radar in terms of Christian doctrine. They don't think about the fact that the love of the Father was first set upon the Son in the context of His office as the mediator. The Lord refers to the Father loving Him before the foundation of the world. And there are at least two issues that we need to discuss briefly this morning in that regard. First, what is this love of the Father which He set upon His Son before the world's beginning? If we're not careful, we will make that statement in the passage simply a tautology. We will say the Father loved the Son before the foundation of the world because the Father has always loved the Son. The Father and the Son are divine persons. They are eternal. And the Father has always loved the Son. The Son's always loved the Father. And so, of course, He loved the Son before the foundation of the world. But that's not the point. It's true, but it's not the point. That's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is not speaking of the eternal ontological love that exists forever and always has between persons of the Godhead. He is referring to the gratuitous covenantal love which the Father bestowed upon Him as Christ. Here we have to make the distinction without making any separation at all, the distinction between the eternally begotten Son and the Son as Christ, the Son as the Mediator, the Son as the last Adam, the Son as the Son of David, the Son as the Son of Man who comes to redeem and save God's elect. Throughout John's Gospel, and fre frequently in chapter 17, we have seen that the Father gave certain persons to the Son to save, all of whom would in time come to Him in faith and be saved. But before God said, let there be light, He said, let there be a church, as we've reminded you many times, our brother David Henry likes to point out. It is a people for His own possession, a people redeemed by the sacrifice of His Son, a people saved from sin and death and judgment and fitted for everlasting life. And it is in that context that the Father loved the Son before the foundation of the world, not just as the eternal Son of God, but as the chosen Redeemer of God's elect. But second, we need to reflect upon this expression before the foundation of the world. Now, there are a number of references throughout the New Testament to the foundation of the world, what we might associate with the beginning of creation. But the exact form of this prepositional phrase only occurs three times in the New Testament. Besides here in John 17, we have it in Ephesians 1 and also in 1 Peter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, the text says this, He, that is the Father, chose us in Him, that is the Son, the Father chose us in Christ, before the foundation of the world, there's our phrase, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, He, speaking of Christ, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. There's the phrase. But was manifest in these last times for you. Now the other passages that refer to the foundation of the world use a different preposition, although in some cases it seems to be a distinction without a difference. I've given you some references in your notes. I'll let you explore uh, that, that uh, on your own time. But what we have here are three strong pronouncements that are made by Scripture. Things that happened before the beginning of creation, before the foundations of the present world were laid. That is, God the Father set His love upon the Son as the appointed Redeemer of the elect. Secondly, He appointed Christ to die as a sacrifice for the sins of His people. That's what Peter affirms. And third, He chose those who would be saved by Christ in that sacrifice. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 1. 
Thus, redemption is not plan B. It is not God's reaction or adaptation to the problem of sin. Jesus was appointed as the Savior of sinners before God said, let there be light. And, and whatever theological persuasion you may have, whatever doctrinal commitments you may have made, you've got to grapple with the fact that that's what the Bible says. I speak as someone who came to grapple with that at a time I belonged to a tradition that denied that. But what do the Scriptures say? You may say, I can't believe that. That God, before He made the world, had already determined that He would save people, how He would save people, and whom He would save. There are people who say, I can't believe that. That that's Calvinism. What about free will? And I would simply ask you in return, what about it? We're not talking about Calvinism here. We're simply reading and reflecting on what the Gospel of John says. And we've not said anything about free will for it or against it, but there's nothing that we have said thus far that contradicts the idea that people make free moral choices for which they are responsible. But the issue is what does the text say? Not what do we want it to say. Not what have we always assumed it to say. What does it actually say? Because the verse is not unclear. It challenges us to think more carefully and more deeply about ideas that many Christians never take the time to reflect upon. They simply know that Jesus loves me, and, and that's all I need to know. Well, in one sense, of course, that's all I need to know. Jesus loves me is, is enough to know, and knowing that, I can be saved. But the reality is there's more that lies behind that. Because before Jesus loved you, God the Father loved you. Him. God loved you before He made the world. He loved you by first loving His Son and appointing Him to save you. And that is awesome. That is mind-boggling and breathtaking, and that is the love of God. And that's the way we're to see the love of God as something that we cannot wrap our minds around. Now in verse 25, we see Again, the clear distinction being made by Jesus that we saw earlier in the prayer. This distinction between the world and the disciples of Christ. He says in verse 25, The world has not known you, Father, but I have known you. I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. Do you, do you see how the, the priority, both logically and chronologically in this case, the, the priority belongs to the Son's knowledge of the Father. It's because the Son knows the Father that we can know the Father. But we can only know the Father through the Son. It is only in Christ and through Christ that we're enabled to know what no one else in the world knows or can know. Now there is, of course, a general knowledge of God that all people have by virtue of creation. The heavens declare the glory of God, and therefore men and women are without excuse if they refuse to gratefully acknowledge Him. But that's not the type of knowledge that is in view here. Jesus is speaking about knowing the Father personally, intimately, relationally, covenantally. He's speaking about not only knowing about God as Creator, but personally knowing and loving God as our Father. And notice that Christ knows the Father first. And only after Christ knows the Father can His disciples come to know Him. Again, this is, this is not just about the fact that the Son is eternal. You say, oh, of course He knows the Father. He's always known the Father, right? As the only begotten Son. But that's not what we're thinking about here. We're thinking about Christ as the God-man. We're thinking about Christ as the mediator. We're thinking about Christ as the Son of Man who comes to do what Adam didn't do and to accomplish what Adam could not ever do for us because of his sin. And so we cannot enter into this relationship with God unless first Christ comes and opens the way. We do not have the right to call God our Father or to be called His children simply on the basis of creation. Sonship is a privilege given by way of adoption. It is not a human right. It is not bestowed upon all creation. This is one of the fundamental tenets of the liberal theology that became very popular in Germany and then was exported to the rest of Western Europe and eventually to the United States that even formed in many ways a historical context for the conflict that led to the formation of the OPC, right, back in the 1920s and 30s. But one of the fundamental tenets of liberal theology is we are all children of God. We are all children of God. 
But that's not the way specifically that Scripture speaks about sonship. Yes, there is a general sense in which you can say we are all God's offspring. That's what Paul says in Acts chapter 17. It's not wrong to say that. But he's not speaking in this peculiar covenantal familial sense. Sonship is not a right of humanity by way of creation. It is a privilege of grace by way of adoption and covenant. This is beautifully and clearly communicated throughout the New Testament. For instance, consider what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 25. The Bible says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Do you see that? You cannot know God, not in this way, not as Father, except in and through Christ. That's it. No one knows the Father except Christ. And no one, no one knows the Father except those to whom Christ reveals the Father. There is, this, there is this unique relationship that the Father and the Son have in the context of redemption that is the basis for our participation in the divine nature, as Peter says it in 2 Peter chapter 1. It's in the very next verse in that passage in Matthew 11 that Jesus goes on to give the great invitation, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But you realize that invitation, come to me, everyone who is weary, everyone who is burdened, come to me. That invitation is built upon the foundation that you cannot know the Father unless I reveal him to you. You can't know him. And if you think, I, I had a, a Bible study last year, uh, one of the studies I do in the community every week, and I had a woman come in, and she said, um, my, my adult daughter, this, this woman's adult daughter, said, I am not a Christian. I was very offended by this. I said, oh, okay. well, what is it that you believe? She said, I, I believe that there is a God, but I do not believe in Jesus Christ. I said, well, that means you're not a Christian. <laughs> she was very offended by this. She said, no, 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 I am a child of God. I know God. I pray I'm a good person, but I don't believe in Jesus Christ, and I don't believe the Bible is God's word. I said, well, you know, I'm glad that you have a spiritual interest and that you have a desire to know God and that you desire to pray and that you desire to live in a way that pleases Him. But, but if you don't believe in Jesus, then categorically you're not a Christian. Well, that's just simply what the Bible says. I mean, you know, terms have meanings and there are simple definitions here. A Christian is one who believes in Jesus. But she could not get that idea. But Jesus is calling to people like that, come to me, come to me. Because you cannot know God apart from me. The only way you can have a relationship with God is to come in faith to me, and then through me, you will come to know Him. You and I must come because we're not already there. We are not born as children of God. We must be born again. We come to know the Father by coming to Him in and through the Son. We must trust in Christ, and through faith we are adopted in verse 26, Jesus goes on to talk about the declaration that He has made to the disciples. I've declared to them your name, the Father's name, and I will declare it, He says. Now, if you had to describe the earthly ministry of Christ, how might you do so? If you summarized His teaching ministry, what would you, what would you say? There are many different ways that you could do that properly, but I doubt that many, if anyone would summarize it in this way. Christ came to declare the Father's name. But that's how Jesus summarizes it in this verse. To know the name of the Father is to know Him. Now this is a different concept than we have in the modern Western world. I know the names of lots of people that I don't have any relationship with. But, but in the world of the Bible, the name stands for the person. It speaks of His authority and it speaks of His life. So to know the name of the Father is to know the Father as Father. It's to be on the inside of that familial relationship, not an outsider, but to actually be part of the household. And as I was reflecting on this uh, in, in preparation for this lesson, I was wondering, is there any 
corollary to that in our own kind of modern Western experience. And, and I think that there might be, in, in this regard, at least analogically, we might compare this to the names of endearment that belong only to members of the same family. Now, surely you have this in your family. We, we had in my family special names for each of our grandparents, and those names only belonged to members of the family or to those that were so close to us that they were de facto part of the family. You kind of knew when they were on the inside when they started being able to refer to your grandparent with that special term of endearment. You could not use those names of my grandparents. Only I could use those names because I was part of that family. You didn't know their name because you didn't know them in the way that I did. Now, uh, we have this in many of our relationships. To many of you, I am Pastor Ellis. Uh, to some of you, I'm just Joel. To my children, I am Dad. And they're the only ones who get to call me that. But Jesus had declared the Father's name to his disciples, and he would continue to declare it. And that was through the further teaching ministry of the apostles, which we have in the rest of the New Testament. It continues to be declared to us, not through new revelation, but through the continued proclamation, explanation, and application which the Spirit makes of that truth in our hearts as we hear, read, study, and learn the word of Christ. So that declaration is going on. Christ is teaching you and me more and more about our Father. While you're listening to this sermon right now, Christ is declaring to you through a fallible preacher, He's declaring to you the name of of your Father. The Spirit is applying those words to our hearts so that we can know who our Father is. Not just as a divine being, but as our eternal, heavenly Father. And when we preach the Gospel, we're proclaiming not just the Word of God, but a Word that is about God personally. Do you see that? I'm not trying to, to deny in any way, shape, or form the objective, external, propositional nature of the Word of God and its truth. Absolutely affirm that in every respect. But do you realize the Word of God is also the Word that tells us about God, as our God, as our Father. It's not a message about men. The Gospel is an announcement about God, His glory, His goodness, His greatness and His grace to us as His children. And this is what we gain from Jesus' teaching. Not just information to learn, but a real relationship with God as Father. He is initiating us into the family. He is telling us who the Father is, much as younger children are taught the names of family members. And is that how we listen to Him? Is that what we take from His teaching in the Gospels and from the further exposition of these themes in the Epistles? When you read your Bible, how are you reading it? Are you only studying theology the way that you would study history or science or math? Or are you becoming better acquainted with your Father and learning more about the relationship that you have with the triune God of heaven? Now, we, I think everyone would say, put in that way, well, of course it's the latter. Uh, you know, of course, right? But is it really? Is, it, is that really how we read the Bible? Is that really how you listen to sermons? Is that really how you participate in Bible classes? Or is it a bit more academic? Is it a bit more rationalistic? There's an intellectual aspect to this, I'm not denying that. But do we realize that Jesus, by means of this truth that is revealed to us in Scripture, is teaching us about our Father? The one whom we cry out to as Abba? That's what we're learning here. And then at the end of verse 26... We see the love of the Father for the Son is bestowed upon those in whom Christ dwells. What is the result of this declaration that Jesus makes of the Father? It is that the love of God may be in the disciples and that Christ will also be in them. Now there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to do this just very quickly and concisely. First, the love of God bestowed upon believers is love that is first given to Christ and then through Him bestowed upon the saints. And that is crucial to understand. This does not mean that the love of God is impersonal. God's love is for you as a believer. It is personal and intentional. It is given to you as a distinct and known individual. It is not generic for every person in the world. It's not some blood bank that God has established to people which people can opt into or out of as they please. But do not ever think for a moment God loves you independent of Christ. He doesn't. He can't. 
He's holy, and you're not. You and I are by nature sinners. We are rebels and corrupt. There is nothing in us for God to love apart from Christ. So God loves you individually, personally, knows your name, how many hairs are on your head. But He does not love you apart from Jesus. He can't. He can't because you are not lovable and neither am I. We're not. We're corrupt. We're polluted. The love of God comes to us through Jesus. Apart from Christ, God can only hate us. It is through union with Christ that we receive and enter into the love of God. And without Christ, there can only be judgment. Second, since this is the case, there is no way that we can receive or enjoy the love of God apart from faith in Christ and communion as a member of His body. There is no category for those who are good people whom God loves but who have no need of connection with the Son of God. I I grew up in a tradition that denies the doctrine of original sin. We believe that children were born actually innocent. Not just that God didn't hold them morally and spiritually accountable for sin. No, no. We believe that, that God hit the reset button every time a baby was born and that child was completely innocent and therefore they did not need to be saved because they were safe. Now, in that tradition, and this is one of the arguments I make when doing evangelism and apologetics in that tradition now, in that tradition, you have millions upon millions of people who have entered into heaven through death in childhood who have no need of Christ. You realize that? You have millions of people who are saved without Jesus. That can't happen. That should immediately throw a flag on the play and say, something is wrong here. Something is not as it should be. You must trust in Jesus. You must be united to Him by grace. You must be a partaker of the body of Christ that is united to Him if you want to enjoy God's love. And there is an extraordinary arrogance in thinking, God loves me, therefore I can do as I please. You are only part of God's family through faith. None of us are natural-born children. We are by nature enemies. It's only through the grace of adoption by union with Christ that we are called sons. Third, there is a difference between being in the midst of divine love and having that love within us. When he preached this passage, Augustine used the illustration of a blind man in a brightly lit room, which I thought is a terrific way of explaining this. The blind man is surrounded by light, but that light does not reach inside him. And so it is in the present world. Reprobates and unbelievers live in the presence of the love of a gracious God, but that love does not penetrate them. It does not abide in them. Jesus has declared the Father's name and the Father's truth so that His love might be in us. It is the gospel that the Spirit uses to turn the light on for us. As Newton famously wrote, and we sing, I once was blind, but now I see. We see because the love of God has penetrated our hearts. And the gospel is not just a doctrine to be believed, although it is certainly not less than that. It is a love to be received and enjoyed. And so forth and finally, Christ dwells in those who are indwelt by the love of the Father. And this is where we see the multifaceted beauty of our connection to Christ. Christ dwells in us because saints are the temple of the living God. We dwell in Christ because He is the rock to which we run and in which we hide. He abides in us. We abide in Him. There is a mystical, organic, covenantal indwelling through our union with Christ and engrafting into His body. Do you see how interwoven that relationship is? Very important that you see that because you need to know that you will never be alone in your life. It will never happen. It can't happen. It's not possible. If you are united to Jesus Christ, You can never be alone because Christ is dwelling in you and you are dwelling and hidden in Christ. It's just not possible for you to be forsaken by God. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of God because you are hidden in Christ and Christ is dwelling in you. Brothers and sisters, the Lord has declared the Father's divine name so that His divine love may also be received and enjoyed. Your earthly parents, as much as they may love you or not, your spouses, and or, you know, I hope you don't have spouses, but your spouse and your children, of which you may have several, 
whether they care for you well or not, your friends and even your brethren, as much as they wish to support and encourage you or not, none of them can love or care for you as your Heavenly Father can. It is impossible for Him to cease to love you because He loves you because you are united to His Son. Do you see? This is why it is so important that you know that God doesn't love you independent of Christ. Because if He loves you independent of Christ, He can change His mind. He can. Today He loves me. Tomorrow He loves me not. Today I'm lovable. Tomorrow I'm not. But if He loves you only in and because of Jesus Christ, He'll always love you. He always will. He can't not love you. He can't stop loving you. Because He is unchanging. And His favor toward His Son is unchanging. Our acceptance is not based upon the strength of our faith, the purity of our worship, the adequacy of our repentance, the progress of our sanctification, or the sufficiency of our good works. Our acceptance is based solely and completely on the acceptance and perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is in us, and therefore the love of the Father always shall be too. Let's bow together and pray. Heavenly Father, we want to be gripped by this truth more than we often are. We so often think in rather selfish ways about your love, O oh Lord, the love that you have set upon us, but how little we think of the love that you have first set upon Christ. And that it is in this connection, in this context, Lord, that your love comes down to us and will remain upon us. O oh God, we pray that that love would have its efficacious and transforming work in and on our hearts and our souls that you would cause us to know that we are your children, that we would love you in return, and that with faith and gratitude we would live before you in a way that pleases you and in a way that will manifest your glory. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.